<laughs> Welcome to the, the meeting of the Antiquarian Society. Um, one or two announcements before we start. There are, of course, the magazines and the books that are very reasonably priced here for those who don't have them. Um, Elizabeth has drawn my attention to the Archaeology Scotland Summer School, which will be held in Deeside between the 19th and the 22nd of May this year. Anyone who's interested can pick up a flyer on the way out. I don't think there are any more announcements, Angus, do you have anything? So I think we'll just get on to the main event of the evening. That's a talk by Ian Mitchell on the Russian clearances. Ian's a well-known author. His books including Isles of the West, A Hebridean Voyage, and Isles of the North, A Voyage to the Realms of the Norse. He's also written a book, The Cost of a Reputation, uh, about the Altington Tolstoy libel trial that took place in London in 1989. He was the founder and director of an organisation called People2, an organisation that describes us to defend rural communities from the impulse of centralised bureaucracy. Ian grew up mainly in South Africa, but lived in Ireland for 15 years, and he now lives in Campbelltown, having spent quite a lot of time in Moscow with his Russian-born wife. So without further ado, Ian, I shall Thank you. to you. Right, well, thank you all for coming out on this uh, brief night, although it's not so cold. Um, the subject of the talk is the Russian clearances, and the, the, the basic premise behind it is that the Russian people have su suffered a kind of clearance from the land in not a totally dissimilar way to the way the Scottish people have, or should I say to the same similar extent, but it's very different, um, it's happened in a very different way, and it's partly related to the history of Russian colonization of what is today Russia. So I hope you won't mind, but I'm going to give a potted history of the Russian um, kind of uh, uh, ownership of Russia, if you like to put it like that. Um, and so this is just a photograph of... Uh, some cupolas, because I, I sent a headline to um, Mark for the paper to say cupolas come to Campbelltown, which I thought would be rather splendid for his article about it, but he didn't choose to use it anyway. There's a cupola, <laughs> just to start. And now, if you can just um, give us the next slide, which is a couple of maps, just to begin with. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go on too far with maps. But um, the you'll notice that here, Rush, Rus states is an, is an area which um, is actually the beginning. The, the, these are what the, the people who lived in this area are what became the Russians. And <coughs> to the, you know, there's the East Slav, uh, the, the, well, really, that's wrong. It should be the West Slavs over here. Uh, East Slav, West Slavs, well, I think there's the East. Anyway. The kind of people who became the Poles, the Czechs, all those kind of people were in this area. And what happened, the founding of the Russian nation really, was not dissimilar to England, and as some people would argue Scotland in the sense that it came from an, an invader. You know, Fergus came over from County Antrim, William came over from Normandy, and in this case the, a guy called Rurik, um, was asked by the people who lived up in this area to come and invade the country to restore order, L law and order, the rule of law, you could almost say, <laughs> which I'm writing about in a different context, so that's what their concept of it was. And the Vikings, these were Viking people, and they came down the rivers. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see this is how they moved around the country. It was all in these huge rivers, which you'll see some pictures of in a minute. They, they, they could go up the Dnieper here, the Dvina here, they could go up the... Neva there, down to the headwaters here of the, uh, the Dnieper, and also this comes down to the Don, and this is the Volga, which comes down there. So it was very easy to move around the country if you had boats that were light enough that you could carry them between the, the headwaters of the, the, the rivers that flowed that way and the headwaters of the rivers flowed that way, which they could. The Viking boats were famously light. <coughs> so they, they rolled them on logs, greased logs, and um, got them, and they, they, they basically traded between the Baltic and Constantinople, which was the richest city in Europe at the time, and, uh, you know, the whole of the Greek, the late uh, Greek <coughs> world, 
And this was in, it was in, the dis dates are disputed, but it's something like 860, 880, those sort of, that sort of time that this famous invitation to Rurik was issued. So if we have the next slide, you will see here's a picture of the kind of boats they sailed in. Um, they were adapted for river travel. These are, these are Viking boats. Well, I mean, that's a model, but they were like that. But they weren't the sort of things that you see sailing over to Greenland or anything. They were, they were big, beamy, deep draft things for, uh, and small for portage. Um, a tarbot, by the way, is a, is a porter. This, they, were, they had the tarbots between the two things, I'm told. They're not a Gaelic speaker, but anyway, did live in tarbot for a bit. And this is Bielorzyevsk. If you just go back to that slide, uh, sorry, that it's the Biela, that's Bielorzyra, which is, means White Lake, literally. So they were heading up there and coming down the Volga. So Bielorzyevsk is simply the name of the town from the name of the lake, Bielorzyra. So, okay, carry on again. So um, then there's another picture um, of the of the, uh, the the boat from the. From the <coughs> from the front, and this says Grad Bielozersk Asnalven v 862 Gordon, which means it was found, the, the town of Bielozersk was founded in 862. So the key thing to understand about the Russians is that they were the they were a product of um, of Viking invaders, merchants, slave traders, etc., who came in and intermarried as one does all over the place, including here in Scotland when the Vikings arrived, and Russia grew out of that. So, next one. Now, I just put this one in. This is this is the monastery in Bielorzyask, and that thing in front of it is the River Volga. So, to give you some idea of the usefulness of these waterways as for transfer, exploring the country, that's artificially large there because there's, it's been dammed a bit further down. But it's it's always it's you know it's. You'll see one more picture of it a bit further down, and it's, it's vast. These rivers are enormous. The Volga <coughs> flows 2,000 miles from its headwaters to the Caspian Sea, and in that time it dropped 600 feet. So that will give you an idea of how, I mean, I, I, th I should think the Clyde, in, 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 you know, a hop and a skip drops a couple of thousand feet, probably from Lead Hills, I don't know, but it, you know, it, it's, it's really slow, sluggish, wide, Things. So there were, there were ideal highways. We had the sea and the Berlins sailing here. They had the, the rivers. So okay. And this is just I just put this here because it's a rather nice picture. That's the interior walls of all the places for firing out. It was a pretty savage sort of um, uh, environment they lived in. But um, that uh, there's also I didn't put this in, but there's a little sign just to the left of where we're standing. They said, "Don't go on the grass. Beware snakes." Mm -hmm. So that also illustrates to you how the land of Russia has never fully been has, has never fully been kind of tamed, if you like. So next one. Now this is a a guy on a on a river, uh, at least a, a sort of well a kind of river kind of lake thing. Um, to the back here, um, where he's obviously just for a hobby, <laughs> he's built this sort of semi Viking y boat. But it, again, it's very beamy, very kind of easy. You know, you can see the minute it heels over, the, 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 the beam and the, uh, on the lee side always, you know, is, is suddenly expanded, and the beam on the windward side is, is uh, reduced, so it's very stable. And also, I just like that picture because it illustrates the way Russians use the countryside today. We'll get more of the reasons for that, but it's just, nobody bothers, it's just free for everybody, and there's none of this fences and what, what a, a close Russian friend of mine, when she first came to England 30 years ago, said was um, cut and polished grass after having seen Cambridge. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> there's no cut and polished grass, and the idea of mowing Spending your spare time mowing the lawn is considered just idiotic. You know, better things to do, drink or sleep. Um, so, uh, okay, next one. And uh, now, this now Russia starts to expand. So the, the what we what we were saying there was these rivers. They came sort of down down this way to the Sea of Azov and, and the Black Sea, and down here to the Volga. And what happened with uh, in the in the 
period between the, the Viking uh, era, and I'm going to tip on this in a couple of sentences because it's, it, it, I, I could go on for a day, but it's fascinating, and the sort of 17th century, beginning of the 17th century, was that the um, Mongols arrived along here, which is why you now have the Khanate of Kazan, the Khanate of Sibir, which is now Siberia, and the Khanate of Astrakhan, which is the town that's at the, uh, at the entrance of the, where the Volga goes down to the Caspian Sea. And what happened was that Ivan the Great unified all the little, uh, all the little principalities that um, <coughs> Ivan the Great, grandfather of Ivan the Terrible, uh, he lived from about 1450 to 1505 or 3, I don't remember. And he, by utilizing the Mongol <coughs> forces, this is very key. <coughs> In other words, <coughs> he, 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 the, the Mongols had a headquarter, the Mongol headquarters was a place called Sarai, which was just down here at the lower end of the Volga. And they all lived on the steppe, but they were nomads, they just drove sheep and goats all over the place. And they just extracted tribute from the Russians. <coughs> Ivan delivered the tribute and would go and say, oh, Moscow, here's the Moscow pile of gold and silver. That's all they wanted was precious metals. <coughs> they didn't want what we would think of as economic goods. They wanted precious metals and stones and things, especially silver. And he'd say, oh, the Tver, the, the guy in Tver, he's giving me a hard time. Can you lend me... 20,000 horsemen to go and destroy Tver. So the Khan would say, okay, you know, let's have a look at the pile you brought. Yeah, that's big enough. Off you go. There you are. So off he would go and he would collect the stuff from Tver. So it was a kind of protection racket, really. But the main point about it is that in the, in about the 16th century, the time of Ivan the, Ivan the Terrible, the balance changed, or arguably a bit earlier, but it was over a period, by the time Ivan the Terrible came on, the balance had changed. And it was now the, the, uh, the Russians were on the offensive, having still taken all the tribute they collected from the Russian people, but instead of delivering it to the Mongols, just kept it for themselves to build up their own armed forces in order to go and plunder their own people. And the story of the Russian state is the plunder of the people by the state. That's what my fundamental book is about. It's called, I refer to as internal empire. But anyway, the external empire started growing here when... Ivan the Terrible uh, uh, conquered Kazan and Astrakhan and he died in the process of, of beginning the conquest of Siberia. And this is, this is very, very key. So next slide. And this is Ivan the Terrible's palace where he ruled the uh, place from. A place called Alexand Alexandrovskaya Sloboda, which just means Alexandra kind of settlement. And he went out of Moscow because he was so terrified of all the people in Moscow, most, so many of whom he'd murdered or plundered or, you know, done ghastly things to. Uh, I have a picture of the, they've got a model there of his torture chamber. Unfortunately, I didn't put it in here thinking time is limited and we might get distracted and it might be too interesting. But if we do have a picture of his bedroom. Next one. That, in the, in the, down in the basement, that's, I mean, I'm the terrible is a reputed to have slept. But anyway, Ivan the Terrible um, organized this expansion or started the expansion by taking over the, the Tatar Khanates on the Volga. So now the Russians had the whole command of the, the whole length of the Volga. So they were really kind of in business now. They had also taken over the Novgorod, which is all the northern bits. So really from the Arctic Sea down to the Caspian Sea, they were masters of a a, a long and not that thin, but said thinner than it was long, strip of territory. So next slide. This is. I'm sorry, the, the, the maps will slow down, but they're important. Bear with me. So here is Moscow. Right. Uh, this this area here was what Ivan the Great started with. He then took over Novgorod very brutally and and uh, uh, unpleasantly cheatingly basically and they had all this huge they were just fur trapping it wasn't they didn't really settled up there but they were selling it all over to the Hanseatic cities of the Baltic London Shetland you know Bergen all over the place and Ivan the Terrible added this bit here the Volga so this green bit so now Russia because it had all the communications to get down to the Middle East and the Black Sea 
and everything like that. Russia was in business as a main state. Now, the amazing thing about Russia is between, there was a terrible, when Ivan the Terrible died, he left the country in a terrifically disorganized state, and there was a thing called the Time of Troubles, the Smutny Agrimia, which lasted for about 15 years, and the czars came and went, and there was a civil war, and there was, the Poles invaded half of the western bit, and there was all sorts of things. And, um, and in fact, there was a Polish, semi-Polish czar on the, on the throne of Moscow at one stage. And uh, sh very soon after that was, um, situation was resolved by the election of Michael Romanov in 1613, the first Romanov czar, very soon after that was organized, the country started expanding. And by the end of the, th this, is, this is, you're talking of the 1620s, 1630s, by the time Peter the Great came to the throne, um, which was 17 or 16, sort of 80 something, by the time he died, which was 1725 or three or something, Russia extended here. And you, you have to understand is that uh, the distance from Petersburg to Vladivostok, which is over there now, it's not still wasn't in Russia those days, is about the same as from here to Cape Town. So, like, it's a vast, 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 vast area. I mean, the United States would fit twice into that. And this is really critically important because the Russian attitude to land is based around the fact that it's limitless. And uh, for, as far as they were concerned, it effectively was limitless. And there were very few people living in most of it, so if we just carry on, um, you will see what they decided to do when they had all this wealth. And I've just, I've slightly, uh, I've got to diverge here, but I'll just point this out. This is Catherine the Great's palace in Peter, <coughs> Petersburg. Now, the thing about this is that she was the heir of, of Peter the Great, but well, not directly, but she was, um, she came to the throne about 40 years after Peter died. And she had this huge empire, which was totally disorganized, um, but you know it was run by a, a, a kind of a kind of cadre of, of uh, semi-Germanized Baltic German kind of officers and a load of Russians. <coughs> and the, the the Tartar plundering principle still carried on. I mean, the Russian people were dead poor. Uh, Petersburg was, is always said to have been a city built on bones because so many peasants were drafted in there to work on building it up, building the keys, you know, canalizing the river, building the house, etc. That they, they all died. But they, the, the, uh, the Tsarina lived in this sort of comfort here. So you, I hope, understand that the, the, the Mongol principle that the Khan is in absolute control of absolutely everything is is maintained and he also he owns all the land so this is a this is a the sort of the, this is as it were the russian big house in the estate um that's for the one catherine catherine <coughs> Craig had designed and spent a fair bit of time in there and she lived there totally but uh designed by australian italian so next thing next slide and that's the front of it you see look at it i mean just it, it's unbelievable. When you first catch a sight of it, you can't believe it. Um, there's my dear wife kind of gesturing to somebody or other. But, um, so, next slide. And Peter the Great, nearby, there's another thing that Peter the Great, Pedro Varietz, a, a, a palace that he built as well. And I just put that in because you can see in this, and a lot of the Catherine stuff in the 18th century, when you've got this complete disconnect between the Russian... Um, call it the Russian, <clears throat> it's not really upper class because it's, it's, it isn't a class, it's a tiny little, you know, the Russian ruling elite, the sort of the inheritors of the Khan's power, they lived in a completely European style, this sort of Baroque style of architecture that's there, you see it also in the, in the, uh, the Tsarska Cielo, the one before, and the ordinary people live completely differently. Now, <coughs> I think, the next slide, yeah. Now this is the middle of, of Petersburg, just a summer day I was there. And by the late 19th century they were beginning to get uncomfortable about this and they had they started building more Russian style buildings. And this was the the famous church that's the Neva River there, the Winter Palace is sort of just over there. Um, and um, the 
that that church there was built on the on the spot where Alexander II was assassinated, and uh, it's a, a famous landmark now in Petersburg. It's the only part of Petersburg that's really got this sort of pseudo-Russian thing. All the rest of it's European. So you've got a European, a very very thin European veneer, which is taken over from the slightly thicker but but equally plundering Tartar veneer, and at the Beneath that is the actual Russian people who just kind of slogged out east to Siberia and slogged away all over the place. And if the next picture, <coughs> I think, will show you uh, Red Square. Now, there's St. Basil's. That's the original of that kind of architecture. I'm not going to go into the architectural thing of it because it's, it, I've, it would take too long. I've got the slides and never end. But uh, it was built by Ivan the Terrible as a celebration of the taking of Kazan, the Khanate of Kazan that I said on the Volga, and finished sometime after he'd taken the Khanate of uh, Astrakhan. But, you know, you can see that's the genuine Russian style, um, and they're trying to imitate it. So carry on, next one. And this, I think I rather like, that's the actual, it's called the Ivan Veliki Tower. That's the Tower of Ivan the Great in the Kremlin. And... Um, uh, that's like the original Russian um, thing. That was built in the late 1400s. Um, again, Italian architects, the Russian architects tried to build it and the tower kept falling down, so they got some Italians in, who incidentally later on built these, these kind of towers. Um, but there's a kind of Russian tradition which, which was being asserted, but was gradually... You know, it, it, it never survived because Peter the Great took over and basically re-established the Mongol style of rule, but in a completely European sort of way. So, carry on. Um, now, this is, let's, we're getting more out in the kind of, it, within that whole thing, there were people, <coughs> uh, the, the kind of people round the Tsar started to build themselves houses in the country. Peter the Great started the thing of Dutchers, um Davak in Russian means to give, and a dacha means like a gift. And he would give these people large areas of ground and say, go and build a house, because I want people round about me. I don't want you hovering out in the provinces, plotting rebellion. I want to keep an eye on you. And he would start giving, <coughs> giving out ground on the condition they built houses. And some people actually went so far as to go to Moscow, which was, you know, a little bit uh, not on. And the guy who built that house was a guy called Jakob Bruce. He was actually a Scotsman who uh, was the chief of, he was the main astronomer, and he was also some kind of weird, he was a very much into the occult arts, but uh, he, he, he was the son of, a, of a, um, a civil war emigre from Scotland. He, I think, was actually born in Russia, if I'm not, not mistaken. Certainly very young he was there. He spent his life in Russia. And um, he <coughs> commanded the artillery at Poltava, the great battle where the Russians defeated the Swedes and uh, really took over the eastern coast of the Baltic, again expanding. And by the way, here is the famous bicycle which just took me thousands of kilometers around Russia, trouble three star, yours truly sweating at the controls. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's, that's a thing called the Glinka estate, but it just illustrates now, you know, I've tried to paint a picture of the whole, the overall structure of the thing, but then let's focus down. The, the sort of gentry were building houses like this, which I think are extremely elegant and very nice, and inside they're not huge, um, they're not palaces at all, they're just, you know, large, large houses. So carry on, next one. And I just put this one in here because I, the, I, I have so much stuff, I had to limit it. And I thought, well, there's a few interesting things to say about this town called Borovsk. Um, and this is, I, I put this in also partly because this, this is a monastery in the middle of Borovsk, quite a famous monastery. And you can see this sort of Russian style of architecture in the church in the middle. This is sort of Baroque. It unfortunately goes out of the picture on the right, the top, the tower. And there's another Russian cupola just over in the, in the distance there. And the point about Russia is it's a complete mix of, of, of Tartar influences, of European influences, of Byzantine influences, of pagan influences, of all sorts of things, German, um, French, uh, not so much British, although... Um, 
Dutch has been recently, but you know, up to the sort of revolution time, the French, I mean, the, the aristocracy until the mid 19th century really spoke French. After that, they tended to speak English. But um, so it's a, it's a great melting pot, which is what makes it so interesting. So, next slide is another, you see, here's another, of, that's just around the corner from that place. And these wildly colourful buildings. Now, this, these dominated the countryside. So, carry on. Another one. Oh, that's I just put this in for fun. This is, that's in the just out in front of the monastery, the, the pigeons, feeding the pigeons. So next one. Um, and here, by the way, this is also also just two two things as a bit of a diversion. In this town, is very famous for the fact that people have been going around secretly. Nobody knows who does it. Drawing these murals. They do it late at night or something like that. I don't know, but it's a it's a. Or people, I'm sure the people who live there know, but nobody will tell the authorities. Because Russia has this tradition that you never tell the authorities anything. Because it is, as I say, an internal empire. You don't give the imperialists, including Putin today, um, any kind of credence at all. I mean, if the country's attacked, everybody gets together. But apart from that, you just try and get rid of them. And I rather like this, this, um, this little... That, mural of this old 17th century lady, I think it's it's the widow of Morozov who ref went and was killed, you know, Merton, um, what's the word, um, uh, executed um, for refusing to convert from the old orth belief to the new type of orthodox involved. Anyway, next one, there are all sorts of other whimsical ones like this, all over the town, which I think is rather nice. <coughs> So carry on. And I put this one in here just since we were in Boros. That's the house that Napoleon stayed in when his army passed through Boros after uh, abandoning Moscow. <coughs> he spent the night of the Battle of Mala Yaroslavets there, which uh, experts on Russian history will know is the battle that really forced Napoleon out of Moscow because he was going to try and retreat by a southerly uh, route and kind of go very slowly and see how he could how he could get on, but the, he was stopped at that particular battle, which is not far from now. I went to see it, very interesting. Uh, but anyway, that's the house he slept in, the night of the battle. So, next one. Oh, and I don't know if, is Mark here? No, he's not the rotter. Uh, <laughs> I just put this in for him, because this is the, this is the, this is the, this is the editorial department of the Boris, Boris is this year, in other words, local newspaper. So, Eat your heart out, Campbell's out, Korea. <laughs> and, um, okay, next one. So, now this is starting to get more into this thing with the countryside, because that's, that is that monastery. Now, you're not very far away from it, but Russia, the minute you get two steps from any, any part of civilization, it just disappears into nature. And I just think that's, that's a... That's a very interesting illustration of the basic problem of Russia. We were accustomed in, in the West to think of, of uh, wild nature as little islands that are surrounded by urbanization. In Russia, it's exactly the opposite. Urbanization is a little island surrounded by completely wild nature. And that also totally influences the Russian attitude to land. So, carry on, next one. Now, I put this one in here. This is, I think, the second last of the maps. But this is also incredibly important. This is. The, the lighter bits are where there's more people. Now, the, what you have to really kind of take on board is from this line up here, which is just north of Petersburg, apart from the line of the Trans-Siberian Railway, which goes around there, this whole area, which is, you know, two-thirds, as you can see, of the kind of, that's Russia today, that's, um, that's not the Soviet Union, is essentially empty. It's uninhabited, and it's largely uninhabitable because it is just thick, dense forest, it's poor soil, and it's also got a deadly type of um, uh, kind of, um, what are they called, tick, ticks, that have come from Japan and China and somewhere, and are slowly spreading across the countryside. I mean, they were, they were in this area in the 60s, now they're sort of over here, you know, and people don't go out into the forest unless they're totally dressed up so they can't be bitten by these things because in a small number of cases you, you get some kind of brain disease um, and you die. I mean, 2% of tick bite injuries end up in death. 
So it's uninhabitable place. I don't, that again is another aspect, unusual aspect of the whole thing. I mean, the, the highlands of Scotland are uninhabited and not very habitable in some senses, but they're not nothing really quite on that scale. So that's an important thing to me. The whole populated area of Russia, the density of population is all just, this, that's, that'll be Moscow there, that'll be Petersburg there, this will be Kazan on the Volga there. And, um, you know, this, this is sort of down in the Caucasus. So it, those are the density, but the rest of it is just pretty empty. So they, th their way of using the land was very wasteful. They didn't bother, sort of, there was no reason to invest in one. There was a lot of sort of flash and burn agriculture, really. So next one. And I put this on in because I think it's a good, you know, that's, that's in the, you know, the civilized bit, if you like. But, you know, that's what it looks like in the winter. There's just nobody there. There's one house, or there's two buildings, you can see. Three buildings, actually. No, two buildings. But, you know, who lives there? Who knows? Um, it's just a wasteland, in a way. Okay, next one. And uh, these two old people who, this is at a friend of mine's dacha. Um, near a uh, little village called Vasilieva, which used to be a collective farm village. But you see there, you just see behind the old guy there, just, it just goes on forever. And there's a, a huge line of forest at the other, at the end of it. And uh, what goes on in the forest? Who lives there? Nobody knows. Nobody, nobody can ever find out. Nobody's going to go in there. Um, and it's, it, well, Russians ordinarily believe that all sorts of bandits and escaped people live in the forest, and it's quite, you can quite believe it. And here we are, all, of, all these pictures here are in, I must stress, in one of the most densely part, populated parts of the whole country. So that makes a huge difference to clearancing and so on. But, anyway, carry on, I'll get to the clearancing in a minute. These, these old people coming to their, I don't know if that's their house or the moving past it, it's not a nice picture, but it's just trudging away in the Russian manner. Next one. And I just put this one into the farmers of you might be interested. Those are the bales of hay just lying out in the snow in the winter. Uh, you know, see the size of the field. I mean, it would take you a week to plough it. And, um, yeah, and it's all like that. Just vast open fields. Because nobody ever really bothered to enclose it. In the pre-Soviet times, it was all um, kind of run rig in the sense that it was, it was they redistributed the land every so often. <coughs> so it wasn't enclosed the village. It was all owned by the village commune. Then they tried shortly before the First World War to privatize it and uh, have particular individual farmers um, uh, kind of uh, having private property, real proper private property, I think, and um, that didn't that didn't last because the First World War came along, and then in the um, uh, Soviet period they they nationalised all the land and in the start they gave it back to the peasants before Lenin did, but then Stalin came along, and in the first five year plan which started in 1928 they just they they collectivised the whole thing so all the, the land that the peasants had just got after, <clears throat> after about 600 years of waiting for it was taken away from them and anybody who protested was killed. Anybody who looked sideways was sent to the gulag. That was the light punishment. And the whole thing was turned into these vast farms. The whole idea was to create surplus population, surplus food to feed the cities to, so they could build an armaments industry and take over the world. But the first thing they had to do was take over Germany. <coughs> but, you know, it was a it was a, a project that, that, that has often been said by historians, reinserfed the Russian people. They were effective. They had no internal passports. They couldn't move. They couldn't get on a train um, to go anywhere because you needed a passport to get on a train. So they were trapped. They were literally bound to the soil. <coughs> they had this, these huge great farms. Weren't, weren't very efficient at all, but uh, they were according to one measure of the thing was fair, um, but in the sense that everybody was semi-destitute. So, next one. And, yeah, and until recently, well, until still, you have, they, they lived in these kind of houses. And we'll come on to the use of these houses in a second, but 
I, I just rather like I put this one in because the next shot I got was the guy who lives in there who came out <coughs> to talk to us. As you'll see, next one. <laughs> there we are. Recognise him? I saw him. I think in Long Row the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Has a different hat on. <laughs> I mean, charming people. We had a long chat with them. Just you know, just they just put up with them. They just they just get on with life. There's no, I mean. Despite the amount of snow, Russia is not a country of snowflakes. They just get on with it. And these old guys that live in this appalling conditions, and the next side I think you'll see the well. Here's the, oh no, oh no, the well. Anyway, okay, right, well, yeah. Okay, next one. Well, this is the last map. And I, I'm going to point this one out because to really ram home this contrast with Europe. This is something that I, I think is, um, is very significant symbolically because the we all know about the German invasion of 1941 and they got to Stalingrad and so on. And Stalingrad was 2,000 kilometers from Berlin. And Hitler had to set up a head, forward headquarters in Vinitsa in the western Ukraine and uh, all this kind of thing. There was a whole, you know, you know, it was an enormous campaign to get to Stalingrad. A thousand miles from where they started off and 2,000 kilometers from Berlin apparently. Now, in one of the studies after the war, the one of the there's a book by Basil Liddell Hart about the uh, the view from the over the hill, the German general's view of the thing. He interviewed all these people in the, in the late 40s, and one of the points that was made to them is that the, the German army, the troops got depressed after being in Russia for a reasonable length of time, and the reason was because there was so much space they couldn't actually like do anything. You couldn't couldn't sort of go over there and blow something up and make a real difference. There was some scrabbly old hut like that guy, you blow it up, well, you've made somebody homeless, but it doesn't, it doesn't look very great, it's a bit of fire. But, and they, they literally, they, they had psychologists, uh, German army psychologists, trying to, trying to, you know, kind of uh, treat these people for the fact that they, they, they were getting hopeless and they were beginning to just lose interest in the whole thing because there was nothing they could do, there was no visible, um, there was nothing visible to destroy it. But that, they got that far that they were, as I say, just feeling lost in this landscape. And it's very important to understand. This is the map of, of uh, the Soviet Union as it was just before the first or the Second World War. And they had got to Stalingrad, miles away. Stalingrad on this map is just there. Right? What part of this country had they got? And they were getting depressed. It's really important to understand that. It just goes on forever. And um, so I'd make that point about space because it's key to the attitude to land. There's just more of it that you can ever possibly use and certainly destroy the Germans discovered. So, next one. Right, this is just back to the, another winter scene. It's a bit out of sequence, really, but uh, beautiful, I think. Uh, very cold, but very beautiful. So, again. Now, the, this is the communist um, takeover. They were going to change this situation and give the land because the two, the two great um, slogans at the time of the revolution were bread and peace, or some people interpreted as land and peace. They wanted the land back. They were land reformers before their time, or after their time, I suppose, in a way. But the thing is that the minute they, the minute the revolution came. Um, the well, not the absolute limit because it was chaos for a few years of civil war. But as soon as things settled down, the Bolshevik government took over and essentially just cheated them. Um, and I got this photograph partly because a, a good friend of mine went down to see it with me, um, and partly because this is the dacha that Lenin lived in in his last couple of years. So. Within two years or three years of the revolution, he'd set himself up in this uh, rather fine house. I think you'd agree. Um, you know, I could just see it at, uh, over at Askimal and be quite sit on the ground rather well. <coughs> um, but this is Lenin. This is the proletarian headman, and there's a huge museum there. This thing. It's, 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 it used to be called um, <coughs> Gorky. It was a, owned by a Russian merchant family. And he, it's now known as Leninsky Gorky because he lived there. But uh, 
that's the way they set themselves up. So again, the minute the, you know, the Tartar regime had been taken over by the Russian aristocracy under Peter the Great and all this kind of thing, and the minute the Soviets came along, they took over the, the, the role again. And so they destroyed the peasantry and set them up in places like this. And the next slide is the Tsar's Rolls Royce, which uh, um, I think is Lenin, Lenin took over. And that's, that's what Lenin used to go around in, um, in this half-track Rolls Royce with skis on the front. I presume in the summer they took the half-track off. Maybe they only used that one in the winter, had another one for the summer. But anyway, yeah, that's, it. that's in the garage, the stable garage of that house there. Extraordinary. That was Lenin's Rolls Royce, head of the proletariat. So, next one. And here is Lenin and Nicholas having a smoke break in just outside <laughs> Red Square. <laughs> whenever, you, whenever you go there, these guys, they, they, you get you to pose the pictures and charge you a few hundred rubles. To, uh, <laughs> the Stalin as well, you see, was a, I, I didn't photograph him. I once saw him just going back on the metro, just away from leaving work. It was very funny with his uniform half off and his moustache drooping. <laughs> But anyway, that's Nicholas and Lenin, so, okay. Now, next to, the, I just put this other bit in here just to lead into the Soviet thing, because next to that uh, Gorky Leninsky palace is this um, kind of building, which is an interim, late czarist kind of functioning building. And in the next picture, we now have the Soviet. That's the sort of stuff the Soviets built. Hideous, <coughs> concrete, slab-built things falling down now, absolutely useless, and terrible heat signature, frightful kind of carbon footprint problems, and blah, 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 blah. But and in fact, you can see this <coughs> line of dark thing there. That will be the heat pipes going under the ground. They're all over, over the Russia. They're all over the place. But anyway, that, the, 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 so you, you come to the Soviet Union now. We've had Lenin, so now we come to the Soviet Union. And next picture, this is what, talking to the Russian rural life, this is what the Soviets wanted to get rid of. They wanted those huge farms and they wanted to destroy people who lived individually like this. They murdered millions of them. They sent tens, well, eight, probably ten million of them to gulag in one, at one time or another. Or in order to destroy the individuality of the Russian people. Russians are highly individualistic people, well, like Scottish people. And um, they just you know, just carried on. And those things there today, I saw this is on the train going to Siberia. I just happened to snap that particular one. But the next slide too, um, that's again the same sort of thing. You know, a cow just in a puddle <coughs> with some lady there. You know, just, just that's the happy living like that. But this is what the Soviets wanted to get rid of. They wanted to, as Khrushchev put it, they wanted to eradicate the difference between town and country. So that countryside had to be industrialized, so they were a proletariat. A peasantry was always um, anathema to them because it, it felt it had a connection with the land. And this is where the real Russian clearances came in. The early ones, you could say, that it was like rest in Europe. This was just a total, they <coughs> dispossessed them, they inserted them, and they tried to prevent this. But the thing is, one of the great things about Russia is it's so huge that the, even Moscow can't control it. So when you're travelling in Siberia, you see loads of stuff like this. I mean, that, the one with the old guy who out in the snow there, they, they were like that. But those houses were built more recently. This is probably a, these are these are houses that have probably been from before the revolution, judging by the size, because the ones built in the 50s were tended to be bigger. But anyway, next slide. We've got to hurry up here. But here, here's a guy just I saw from the train going to cross the ask, just plying the fields with a horse. And, you know, just probably not because he can't afford a tractor. He just thinks it'd be cheaper, he'd be more free, he could probably buy a tractor, but no, he's got a horse. He's independent. That's the Russian thing. They want to be independent. And uh, the Soviet state, being socialist, wanted to destroy their independence. They had to be part of a union, they had to be part of a, the, the mass, etc. And the Russian people and the Soviet Union fought against each other on exactly the same basis as they fought against the Tartars and they fought against the Tsars, and so on. And uh, the result was that you got those huge, great, um, empty fields, which are particularly, so if you go down the Ukraine, I didn't put in any pictures of that, but they can go to the horizon. But uh, in Siberia, where people could more or less get on with things a little bit more easily, they, they, they managed to 
hang on to a little bit of this sort of thing, individualism. So next one. And there is just another one, just just, <laughs> just life, rural life. Um, lovely, I think. And uh, no planning, of course. And one of the old ladies just on the platform of the thing. Next one. And this is our train going through Siberia. Russia, Russia has a serious railway system, and um, it's the best way I can recommend. If anybody wants to take a holiday in Russia, go by train. And it, it, it's the most fantastic way to see the countryside. It, it runs always to time. Uh, the, those sort of slightly more expensive uh, trains are, are extremely comfortable, they're extremely well organized, and they don't go too fast. They go fairly, but they average speed of about 50 miles an hour, so it's fast enough that you make progress, but not so fast that you can't really see the countryside, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to see it. I did loads of train journeys over Russia, but that's, uh, okay, next one. And this is our train, that one of the halts in Siberia, you stop for 20 minutes or something, and I just thought this was interesting, because this is all the oil going west, our train was going east, this is all the oil going west. So it's a monster railway system. It goes absolutely everywhere. Okay? And that's going into crossing the Ural. So it's the only really hilly bit. Um, and there's this viaduct that we were on, well, spectacular in the early morning light. Um, but until you get to the mountains at the edge of the, at the, edge of the sort of Chinese-Mongolian um, <coughs> Afghanistan border, which are vast and, you know, they come to the Himalayas, until you get to that, the whole country is extraordinarily flat, and then the Urals are the only little bits of hilly ground in the, in the meantime. They're a bit like the borders, I always think. Okay? So, they got into go. This is, this is just on the theme of eliminating the difference between town and country. Now, this is deep in Siberia. We're only 200 kilometers from the Chinese border here. And I went to see this guy. He was in my compartment in the train, and we sort of got quite friendly and chatting over three days, because it took 72 hours of train to get there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he invited me to go and have dinner with him in his flat, and that's where it was. And, you know, those are the kind of things that they built for the industrial proletariat all over Russia, and it's, it, it, it's extraordinary, but they build them all over the countryside as well. Every collective farm will have <coughs> flats on that. They, they, they were done, before that, they just lived in, in anything. Uh, the, but the, Khrushchev decided he would house the country, so they designed these buildings. They reckoned five stories was the maximum they could have without a lift, because it was too expensive to have lifts. So these five-story buildings are everywhere, and it, it, that is known as a Khrushchevka, because it was Khrushchev who uh, had the bright idea of five-story buildings with, with no lifts. Um, but they're absolutely everywhere. They're being slowly replaced in places like Moscow now, but that will be there. Yeah. So next one. And here we are, this is the market, as it were, a bit sad. Somebody's got some potatoes to sell. You know, it's desperate out there, just desperate, because nothing happens. There's no farm, there's no enterprise, nothing. It's just the Soviet Union ground and halt, and nothing has taken its place. So next one. A part of the reason, I just it's just one example, but I just happened, I think it's well worth pointing out, a lot of the ground is utterly unusable. I mean, that's water there. And there are vast areas of because it's such a low-lying flat, it's, it's very clay soil, a lot of it. I mean, you, not when you get down to the Ukraine, of course, that's Black Earth region and everything, but most of the northern part of Russia is very poor soil, not suitable for farming anywhere. And you see there, it's just totally waterlogged. It's just useless breeding ground of midges, mosquitoes, the most appalling things. So, next one. Now, Billy was going to come. I thought, I thought McFadden's contractors would be interested in this. <laughs> the next couple of vehicles here. Yeah, but uh, again, this is the Soviet thing. We're going to be modern. In the middle of all this chaos and peasantry, they're, they're going to be modern. So there's that one, the next one, which is a most extraordinary thing, sort of cross between a truck and a tractor. And the next one, that's a, a sort of German army motorcycle. Well, it's a BMW design adapted. Um, yeah. Uh, next one, and this is McFadden contractors in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there we are. Okay, and oh, this is another. This is also Soviet. You know, they don't even look after the machinery. You know, socialism doesn't. I mean, look at it. This is they drive it along and they keep going. 
But look at the state of that ship. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I, I hope the hob master here wouldn't let anything like that in the long time you know. Okay, next one. And this is the final thing on this theme because this this is this is actually next to not far from John Harrison's place. But that's a that's a uh, a, f a co collective farm. That's a farm housing building that obviously just got stopped in the revolution happened in 1991, and everything just ground to a halt. It's just sitting there. But that's that was you know in the middle of the countryside. You're going to live in that. I mean, who wants to do that? Anyway, there it is. So that was the problem. They were they were cleared off the ground in the Soviet period in order to make way for socialism. Here, people cleared off the ground to make way for capitalism. There's a big way for socialism. Net result, not much difference. So, uh, next one. Um, I just put this in because the upside of all of that, or there were a couple of upsides, the one upside was that anybody who had any kind of privileged job, you know, if you're a senior teacher or, or a sort of a doctor or something like that, you could, you could go, the collective farmers couldn't, but you could go to have holidays in these sort of things. And, the Russians love to just go out into the countryside and just moon around and those sort of um, that sanatorium again you see the the bicycle which now resides in the in the disused lavatory at uh, 2 Burnside Street um, you know they're, 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 they're really quite nice if you like sort of Soviet provision which I actually do I think that you know it's all very basic but it's very kind of the food is healthy the people are friendly the whole thing is totally relaxed but it's kind of, it's it's dead. You just go there and you just relax. And they go and have, you know, kind of physiotherapy and kind of salt baths and whatever. You know, they, it, 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 yeah, I mean, that's that's lovely for a bit, but it, to, to my way of thinking, it get a bit boring after a while. But anyway, that, that's the one upside. The next slide, I think, is the other one. This is Pasternak's house, because all the privileged people had nice little individual houses in Dacha communities, and it is that, the last part of this thing is all about how uh, that kind of tradition has been taken on, but that's where that's where he wrote Dr. Zhivago, it's a museum, you can go and see it, it's, it's very, very interesting, um, and I've got lots of photographs of it inside, but I haven't time to look at them, but um, if uh, antiquarianism and natural history extends to Pasternak's study, maybe one day I'll come and of a continuation, but anyway, that's that's his house uh, in Pirodielkina, just out the sort of Dutch community outside Moscow, which now is 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 not a peaceful place at all. All the writers were supposed to go there, and they never did anything. No, no, none of them that weren't born before the revolution. Um, they produced nothing really, but they were there. And now the whole thing is disturbed by there's a brand new motorway running from Moscow to Minsk that goes just about a mile over to the that side of the picture and, and there's a continual din of trucks and everything so it's not the same as it was but that's that was what the privileged people in the Soviet times who weren't at the top of the tree but you know past an act in this world they, they they were they were able to escape for that sort of thing so next picture but all around the countryside goes on you know just the cows no fences there's nothing there's just somebody there with a fiat jiggly comes and looks at them occasionally and uh, they seem to know where to go. We went through, we travelled through the Kalmyk steppe at one stage, and the, the, all the, the, it was just, you know, grasslands at the horizon, and all the, there was no, there was no, no herding. These beasts just kept together for some reason. They must be trained that well, brought up. They're probably, you know, it's probably genetically imbued in them, because you can't herd them. You know, there's nothing you can do there. I mean, you can have them on the range, like in you know, John Wayne style, but short of doing that, you, 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 you've got to, you just, you know, nobody's going to do fencing or anything as expensive or time consuming or hard work as that. So next one, ah, here we go, this is the bicycle, view from the hand was, that's just, that's, that's within five miles of John's place, that's heading there. Um, but, you know, the, this is kind of through the countryside, it's not exactly sophisticated, you know, the even our guy in Butte would be ashamed of the road in that condition, I think. So, next one. And, but it's beautiful. You pass the, this river there, and they just, you see how wild it is. There's just nothing. You just go down there, have a picnic, make a fire, spend your Sunday lolling on the bank, 
And it's just absolutely, I, I mean, I think it's very, very beautiful. Some people, it's not spectacular, there's no mountains, it's not like Norway, but it's, I can see why the Russian people love the Russian countryside, at least in this part of Russia. You know, there's other bleak, empty bits. But anyway, yeah, I'll carry on, I'm going to speed up here a bit. And the, there's all, this is another feature of it. Because it's so wild and un utilized and unchemical sprayed and everything. You see the flowers. It's like the Macher in, in South Eust in, in, a, in a good day. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. There's wildflowers everywhere. But again, partly this is due to the fact there's no people. They're not going and plowing it and extracting every last piece of economic advantage from it. Um, but uh, the result is that. I mean, that will have been grazed. Otherwise, it would all be forest. But um, So, next one. And yeah, another part. And this is just leading down to the Volga. So next one again. And that's that's the Volga near Ilya's place, by the way, which we're going to see a certain amount of shortly. But, uh, so, so yeah, that's that's the that's the mighty Volga. Okay, next one. Now near this friend of mine's house, which I because I'm going to end up with by pointing out that what has happened since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the thing is. Right up to the end of the Soviet Union, all these collective farms with their idle, drunk, um, irritated population were producing very little food. That's one of the reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed. They had to buy, you may remember in the 1970s, Britain uh, made massive grain purchases in the United States, which was just extraordinary. But the United States feeding Russia, all its, well, it's the Soviet Union, then, which had the whole of the Ukraine as well. And, uh, you know, agriculture just didn't work. Um, but what happened after the after 1991 was that the, it was it was just left to fend for itself. So half the farms just closed down. The one near this dacha where I'm just going to show you the last piece of extremely good land use in Russia, um, the it it, um, it it was a collective farm. Now they've just got a little area where they. Grow, have some sheep and they grow a few bits and pieces, but it's it's not on this big scale because it was uneconomical. Um, Russia still produces a lot of food. It's all down in the southern part, these northern areas. There's no nothing to hold the population there at all. And this is the next village. It's just this little old church, which is still being there with the um, the village pond. Okay, carry on, and the kids uh, riding around. That's the edge of the church the, the, on the right there. And that's my bicycle. Some stuff from the shop, well, Iliad's bicycle. Um, okay, next one. And these sort of houses, next one again, uh, with a well, that's the only sort of water. There'll be no electricity there, probably. Um, there might just be electricity, but nothing else. Um, certainly no gas, no running, uh, no, uh, running water, no telephone. Um, but, uh, yeah, so what happened was these things just sort of collapsed. People, that, that one's abandoned, obviously. And people come and buy them. You could buy them for the $600 the, with an acre of ground, the cost of the paperwork, basically, all over the place. And so people would start buying these places and building new holiday homes. Because what else do you do there? So if you carry on, um, some people, in, this is near Moscow, build these extravagant, sort of bourgeois homes, um, but that's a slightly different thing. That's not really land use, that's just suburban sprawl. So carry on, next one. And look at that one, I just quickly, I mean, you know, the, the, the beauty of having a no planning system to speak of is that you have this really creative and sometimes I think rather humorous attitude to architecture. Um, it's a bit like Johannesburg. It's, it's, well, it's very, very, you know, great feeling of freedom. So as long as you're not attract the attention of the Kremlin, you're remarkably free in Russia. And you feel like building a weird, half of, half of like a mosque and go for it. So next one. Um, but most people prefer to, to, you know, they like this sort of idea of Russian, um, you know, tradition and so on. So there's a little village where I've got quite a few photographs here. A friend of mine built a house. Um, as a weekend and holiday home. So this is one of the other houses in that village called Vasilyeva. Next one. And as you can see, the natural life is pretty abundant. I mean, that's a pretty serious apple tree. Um, 
that will give you enough stomach aches to keep you going for a while. <laughs> the next one, um, some of them are still lived in by some of the older people who were young Kalkhuzniki a while ago and are just retired now and still living there. Next one, and that, there's a round tree or all like that. And uh, that's just a satellite dish there. And uh, carry on, next one. And that's just another one, I think it's rather charming. And next one. And yet, everywhere around, you've just got this, this field goes forever, and then forest goes forever, and you really are in your little bit. So, next one. And some people, what do you do? Some people um, do things, a lot of people actually, do things like restore the local church. This is just one that happened because it's got one particularly interesting photograph in there. <coughs> I've shown millions of them. But so the, 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 they're just volunteers. They go there in their spare time. Next picture. And they just, you know, on the weekends, they're just very slowly. Nobody's hurrying them. Nothing in Russia works very quickly. But they get on with it. They, they tend to do it pretty thoroughly and properly. It's not, these things are not jerry-built when they're redone. But they're done in Russian improvisational style. So next one, and you see it there, it's, it's the inside there. Yeah, they're taking it seriously, but the next picture I think is quite a good one. Now that's looking up into the cupola at the scaffolding. That You could imagine that should be vertical. That they clamber up there, up to the top to do the, to, do, to work on the cupola at the top there. So I thought that was quite a... And that's a long way up. It doesn't really come across in that picture, but uh, I'm not sure I'd want to climb up those rickety balls. But uh, anyway, next one. And all over the countryside, you also find these sort of things just lying empty. You can see it's boarded up on the right-hand side. Old gentry manor houses, which were probably used as as the local palace of culture when it was a, the area was a uh, a um, Kolkhoz, a collective farm. So just inside, to my surprise, I got in and inside, next one, it was all rather smart. The traditional Russian stove there, that's what keeps the place warm, they just feed stuff in there and this all heats up and keeps the place warm all through the winter, just kept going for six months. Next one, and yeah, just another one there. Really rather elegant. And uh, I don't know if there's anybody restoring that, but you can't tell in Russia, you never know what's going on, there's nobody there to ask. Carry on, next one. Now, here we are at this friend of mine's Dutcher. What you can do, you see, the issue, my point is, what do you do? You get a house in the countryside, nothing happens in the countryside, so what do you do? Well, you can see there, it's lovely, it's beautiful. Next slide. Uh, you can go ice fishing, there's my dear wife on the left hand side with Valodia, the neighbour. They take, they go, that's in the river, that, that, the, the, they're standing in the riverbed there, and they bore a hole with these things into the ice and catch fish. As, see the next slide? Uh, this kind of sad looking guy, they sit there all day, and I mean honestly they don't catch very much, I, you know, it's the most, they drink a fair bit of vodka to keep warm, but not exactly my idea of entertainment. So next one. Uh, or you go skiing, again, that's what they used to use you know, to get around with, but now it's just recreation. But, you know, again, it's all just flat roads, it's, you know, it's fine, it's good exercise and so on, but it's not, I think, not that great. Uh, next one, or you go cycling, Tanya again. Um, but again, you just see that, you know, like, where do you go? I mean, you go 50 kilometres over there, it's just the same as here. So like it's this German army problem. What's the point of going in? There? <laughs> Just goes on in the next one. Or you go canoeing, which I also did. Um, with, that's at, at Ilya's house. Um, and uh, again, fascinating, but you could do that forever. So, next one. What you do is you relax with a glass of beer and you cook some fish soup. Ucha, as it's called in Russian. Great favourite. So my friend gets the fish, next one, puts it in the, on the, on this bowl in the barbecue with various other ingredients, which uh, potatoes and rice, as you can see, God knows what else goes in there. I mean, this is one of the most, remember the thing we had at the party, that was Lukha. Yeah, it's one of the most amazing concoctions. So 
you, you cook food, uh, and then next one, then you sit and eat it. That's Ilya's wife, my friend Ilya, who's dishing it out, and my dear wife Tanya, who's sitting there looking hungrily at the bowl. And that's Ilya's house. It's a brand new building, um, and he's got a sort of party house at the back there, you can see, and garage. Um, so, next one. So, the question what to do. I said, you've got to have a croaky ball. Russia has lots of space, we can have a cranky one. And he, I also said, <clears throat> Scrabble in the evening, croaky in the day. So he got a cra Scrabble set, and he plays Scrabble quite a bit. Um, and uh, he got, he's got this gardener guy who comes three days a week. He's a fireman in the local village and has plenty of time off, and he likes to get outside. And he comes and, and basically looks after the whole thing and d does his work here. <coughs> Ivan. <coughs> And uh, so we leveled the ground, um, got some decent soil and peat and put it down there, next one. And in due season, a little bit of scraggly grass and thousands of weeds came up. But we nevertheless had to have a, 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 a celebratory opening. And Ily always likes to play where is kilt and these sort of things. Um, by the way, he's been to Camelotown. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he came, I had a big party when I moved in here, and he came all the way from Moscow um, and cooked that fish soup for a, uh, a party that we had the, the day after, the main party, which we carried it round to the cave, just past New Orleans there, and ate it, sat in the rain in the cave, eating this delicious soup. <laughs> um, so here he is with the champagne, that's his son on the right, and his son's girlfriend over there. So, next one. And you can see it's not exactly a cut of croaky lawn. And the guy in the background is the architect who uh, designed the house and, and everything, Sergei, really nice guy. So that was the opening, the festive opening of the croaky lawn. So next one, there's, there's some visitor helping out. You see by now it's getting, it's getting better, the grass has come on, I'm trying to level it out and roll it. And, I'm not a great expert, but I was hoping that um, Simon Freeman could be here. He's away on holiday, sadly, because he gave me a lot of advice on how to do this. Uh, and also how to get rid of the moulds, because we had a, a terrific mould problem. But anyway, Simon sadly is out of town today. But uh, I, I will show them these things, as he we discussed this Craigie Lord a lot. So, next one. There we are, it's getting even better now. And that's the, the sort of party house at the back there. And next one. And that's a recent picture of it. Now you see that we have a reasonable croquet lawn now. And uh, we're having trouble getting proper croquet equipment. You can get the sort of garden croquet stuff that Ilya already has that we're playing with there, but proper croquet equipment, I think it's essential. Heavy mallets and so on. Uh, we can't get in Moscow or Russia or anything. So we play the, we had another celebration, being Russia, we're having got the croquet lawn going. In fact, it was Ilya's birthday. But anyway, next slide. We go out into the party house and start making some music because again in Russia you can do what you like. You make what noise you like. You can you can have strange boats. You can build weird houses. You can you know you're remarkably free because the government doesn't care toss about you. <laughs> and uh, next slide. That's uh, it's not finished there yet as you can see, but it's it's pretty well finished now. Really, I reckon. Underfloor heating and everything. It's all quite swish. Next one. So there's a big, uh, these are the guests in, in the early evening. Next one. And the music starts. So this fantastic band, a guy came from Moscow with some friends who played in a major Russian rock band of the 90s. And uh, they had a really, there's a really good, really, Ilya plays and the, the architect who's playing there. I didn't photograph it because it's pretty boring. <coughs> it's uh, fine for people who are there. But I just thought these, this one of the, all the ladies photographing them with their phones. Next one, there's, there's another one. You see. And uh, so, yeah, next one is the... That, I just like this picture. That's the guy from Aquarium, the band, because the previous year he'd come and done this, and I'd taken a whole lot of photographs, and Ilya had printed some and put them up on the wall. I thought the one above him there, that's from last year. So this is... That's from, that's from 2016, I think, and that's 2017, which I thought was rather... <coughs> amusing together. So, next one. The sun goes down. Next one. The moon comes up, as it were. <coughs> That's Ilya. 
and uh, next one is the last one which is on the way home Russian countryside with the cupolas so thank you very much for the Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I think most of us haven't realised just how vast Russia is, but you've certainly put our minds at ease that it is a rather large country. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there must be some comments or questions. Interesting. I wonder, you mentioned that um, it wasn't known who lived in the forests. Was anything like a census ever attempted? Sorry? Uh, uh, a census. Did, did oh, yeah, Russia has censuses, but, but I mean, these are, these are outlaws. You, you know, they're like Robin Hood in the, in the Greenwood. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a theory, it's a speculation, sorry, that fascinated me when I was there. I used to ask lots of people. But, I mean, long, perfectly serious individuals, like my dear wife, were frightened to go into a forest because they, they thought there were dangerous people living in camp. I don't know whether they were or not. I mean... Don't forget, when the Russian church split in the 1680s, and the old believers, as they were called, the ones who didn't want the ritual change, they split off. They went to live in the forest. Also, when the, um, the, the in, in Ivan the Great's time, when the church had a, a different type of split, but wanted to become more ascetic, a lot of the people, they were called the trans elders, they would go across the wall and just set up a cell in the forest. It's a long Russian tradition. You know, when you, to be a holy man, you go off in the forest. Okay, these escaped criminals and everything are not holy men, but it, it, I, I think in the spirit of Dostoevsky, the Russians would not make such a sharp distinction as we might between holy men and criminals. <laughs> and uh, they, are not, you know, I don't, don't take that wrongly, but you know what I mean? They, they, they would kind of, they might well be living in and it's absolutely impenetrable. You, I'm sure there are pathways in, but they know them all. But, I mean, I, I, on one of my trips, I took a shortcut. I was looking at the map, and I was just going, it was getting dark, and I was going to have to cycle about 10 kilometers to get somewhere where if I went across country under a line of pylons, where the, the, the trees were taken away, I could probably do two kilometers or something like that. I had to walk it, it was too boggy and everything. And I walked to the thing, because I could see there was a, a village on the other side of it. And I walked across to this village, and I, I couldn't see any way to get into it. There were all these great fences and these hideous moss-like houses. And there was one place where they was dig digging, it had a whole lot of tragic digging a pond or swimming pool or something, enormous thing. I mean, bigger, far, three times the size of the pool in the equilibrium there. And um, so I just walked past them and went up, knocked on the back door, nobody there, went out to the front. I met him just coming, he was coming into the gate, he said he was saying goodbye to his friends and leaving. And he was, he was very angry. He said to me, you know, if I'd had a gun on me, I'd have shot you. You don't know who comes out of those forests. <laughs> I, think, I think he meant it. I mean, I, whether he really would have done it, he meant it when he said it. Yeah, he was, yeah, I mean, they, they, so who knows? Who just knows? And I mean, from the Trans-Siberian Railway, I mean, there's one picture you go, middle of Siberia to the top, is something like 600 miles. Uh, no, not really middle, I mean, halfway up to the top, about 600 miles. And there is no road at all. It's on the road. The only way you can get there is to fly to Narilsk, where they land the nickel now. So who knows what goes on in there? I think you were good to... Oh, yeah, uh, what are people's opinions of, like, uh, Russian politics and Putin and the uh, recent events of, like, Ukraine? Sorry, were they what? What are people's opinions of, like, Russian politics, uh, like Putin and uh, that sort of thing? Like that? I think, well, it depends when, because things are changing rapidly now. Uh, since the World Cup, when Putin tried to take advantage of the hysteria to uh, raise the pension age, which has been one of the most unpopular things he has done, um, his popularity has gone down, but on the whole, people <coughs> people support Putin, and the reason they support him is because he represents Russia. They don't support his policies or anything because he isn't. He's more like the Queen, you know. He's a, he's a national figure. He's not a, a policy environment, and the Russians have absolutely no control over the policy environment, and they just support the head of state because they're sort of 
patriotic without wishing to be too mawkish about it. But yeah, they, their, their attitude is, 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 is um, fairly positive, Putin, for, and there's a sort of stage. The first one, the first eight or so years, when he basically destroyed the gangsters. The, 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 the 1990s, after the end of the Soviet Union, the whole country was taken over by gangsters. There was murders of the street all over the time, all over the place, and all the time. And it was absolutely appalling. He put a stop to that, and uh, that was very popular. He introduced stability, he got the economy under control. The first eight years, I think he, he did a lot of good things, and he was widely popular. Then, then it became uh, president for four years, then putting him back again, and it started to unravel because people didn't want to happy about it coming back again. And then he invaded Crimea, and he was wildly popular again. And then that's sort of <coughs> sliding away. The latest theory is that he's going to do a unification deal with Lukashenko and Belarus, and become the czar of the United Country, which means at the end of his six-year stint as president of Russia, he can become start another stint as president of the United States, Russia and Belarus, or whatever. I mean, it's all speculation, but on the whole, he's quite popular. But he's popular not because of his policy, he's popular because he's the head of state and people, you know, want Russia to be, you know, a country that people take seriously. Well, thank you very much. I don't... Sorry? And I want to say that this was very interesting. Very interesting. Well, very well. I think with that, yeah, we'll have to say thank you very much indeed. Most entertaining. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. And um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.